All right. So we're joined all the way from southern Minnesota on the shores of the Mississippi River in the beautiful town of Wynonna, Minnesota, by my friend, high school classmate, graduate of Madison Central High School, Navy veteran, product manager with Thurn Trains and Winches there in Minnesota, Chris Riley. We thank you so much for joining us again. We've got our we got a room full here with us at Velma Jackson High School for our computer science engineering class. We're recording this for all of our friends in Madison County Schools, all the middle schools, all the high schools, all of our great JROTC programs, Madison Central High School, Ridgeland High School, Germantown High School, and the Academic Options Center and our YouTube channel. So we thank you once again for taking some time to join us today. Yeah, no problem, Greg. And I thank you so much for having me. And if uh, for those of you that were around on Wednesday when I was originally supposed to join you guys, I am so sorry. But being a grown up just never gets any easier, man. I tell you what, I can't ever always be where I'm supposed to be on time. But uh, awesome. Uh, I'm really glad to be here. I'm so excited. Greg continues to uh, invite me back year after year um, to talk to you guys. Um, so like Greg said, my name is Chris Riley. I grew up uh, in the Jackson, Mississippi metropolitan area. Uh, I lived in Jackson for a bit. I uh, went to Span Elementary off of Ridgewood Road over there. My sister was a graduate of Chastain and then Murrah High School. Uh, then we moved to Ridgeland and I went to Rosa Scott and Madison Central High School um, there in Central Mississippi. Um, and I wanna talk to you guys a little bit today about uh, my career and kind of what I did after high school. Um, I don't know uh, how you guys are feeling towards the end of high school, but uh, me personally, I had done uh, two tours uh, at the alternative school over there in Canton, Mississippi. Uh, I was a little bit of a knucklehead uh, in high school. I don't know if Mr. Lawrence is still around and out there, but, uh, you know, I was a little bit lost and uh, I didn't know what to do with myself. And, uh, you know, my uh, I was raised by a single mom, me and my big sister. Uh, we had enough money to put food on the table and pay the rent most of the time. Uh, but I certainly did not have money uh, to go to uh, either Heinz or Holmes Community College. I definitely did not have the money to go to a, a four-year university. Uh, I had a lot of friends that were going to college. I had a lot of friends that were staying in Jackson. I still live in Jackson today and working, uh, but I also did not want to do that. So uh, one day I wandered into the Navy recruitment office uh, off of Highway 55 there in Ridgeland, and uh, I said, excuse me, gentlemen, uh, if I join the Navy, will somebody tell me what the heck I'm supposed to be doing with my life and uh, give me food and, and money and shelter? And the Navy had a place for me. Uh, I tell you what. So if that's what you're looking for, you know, they'll, they'll certainly do that. Uh, my time in the Navy, I, I thought was really cool. You know, uh, being in the military is a, a stressful job. Um, you do a lot of important things at a very, very young age. Uh, the amount of responsibility that was imparted onto me, I thought was just insane. Um, but I joined the Navy's nuclear power program. So uh, the Navy, if you did not know, has a couple of platforms of naval vessels that uh, do not operate on gasoline or coal or boilers or any of that stuff. They are very sophisticated nuclear reactors. And those platforms are U.S. Navy submarines and U.S. Navy aircraft carriers. They can literally drive around for the only thing that limits those platforms and how long they can stay on deployment is the amount of food they can carry for the people on board. Um, wow. I joined the Navy's nuclear power program. Uh, I was a mechanic uh, and worked uh, with all of the nuclear stuff in the, in the engine room. So turbines, pumps, heat exchangers, the machines that make water, compress air. I got a really good technical skill set, which was good for me. Uh, in my house, uh, we had a little bucket under the sink and it had a butter knife in it. And one side was a hammer. The other side was a screwdriver. And that's just how me and my mom rolled. So uh, getting a technical skill set in the Navy and learning how to work with my hands, how to take stuff apart, put it together was super great. Uh, the Navy sent me to school for about two years, uh, from 2000 to 2002, uh, and then I did pretty well in school, which was amazing to me because I did not do well in high school, um, and they asked me to stay on and be an instructor before I went on deployment. So then I spent two years uh, teaching people about all the things I learned in Navy Nuclear Power School, uh, and then I deployed on a U.S. Navy submarine, which I'll talk a little bit more about here in a minute, uh, from 2004 to 2008. We did six strategic deterrent patrols. We were a, a nuclear missile submarine. So our job is literally, uh, if you guys have ever seen movies and stuff and you see the president has like a suitcase where he can do all these things and launch missiles, they call it the nuclear football. All of that stuff is completely real. And it was our job to hide in the middle of the ocean and launch a missile at something uh, if that uh, day were to ever come. Thank goodness it did not. 
and then I, before I got out of the Navy, I did a second instructor tour uh, and taught some people again after I did deployment uh, before I departed the Navy. Um, when I departed the Navy, I didn't really want to work in nuclear power anymore, but I had 11 years worth of nuclear power experience. And if you know things about nuclear power and you have experience with nuclear power, uh, the very large utility companies, I don't know what you guys have down there, Entergy, uh, XL Energy, these other big companies, they will pay you uh, a shocking amount of money for, for the amount of time I spent in the Navy, I thought. So I ended up going to work at a nuclear power plant, but what I really wanted to do was work in a business. Um, work for a company that had a profit motive, contribute to an organization. And one day I'll tell you guys, I want to be the CEO of a company. So um, I couldn't really do that with uh, 11 years worth of nuclear power experience, working with my hands. Um, so between like my last couple of years in the Navy uh, in 2013, 2014, uh, I used every single Navy benefit available to me to get as much college degree as I could. You know, um, I'm not super great at school. I don't really like school. Um, but sometimes not having a college degree, at least for me at the time, I felt like was going to prevent me from doing what I wanted to do. Um, so I went to a whole lot of free college. Uh, I got associates, bachelor's, master's degrees, all in business. I did not pay one dollar, not for room and board, not for books, nothing. Uncle Sam gave me all of the money I needed. And I would still have if I wanted to go back and get another certification, I still got some benefits remaining. So wow, it was uh, great for me. And so I spent a couple of years working at a civilian nuclear power plant, and then I was able to kind of transition over into some other roles uh, at some organizations. And now I work for Thern Incorporated. I work in the sales and marketing department, and my job is to be a product manager. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more of that in the beginning. I do want to fill you guys in on some uh, some naval stuff. Um, like I said, being in the Navy is a, a really hard job. Um, in our um, country, we have what's called the nuclear triad, and it's basically a deterrent system. We let the whole world know we have lots of nuclear weapons. Don't mess with us, but we don't want to use it. So it's strategic deterrence, right? And so um, we have nuclear missiles that launch from silos, like in Colorado and North Dakota. We got big stealth bombers that can drop nuclear you know, weapons. They can come from other types of airplanes. And then we have our C uh, launched uh, from U.S. Navy submarine nuclear reactors. And if the whole world were to go a mess and everybody started launching nuclear weapons at each other, the only thing that's going to survive is the submarine that's a thousand feet under the ocean launching weapons at people uh, that can't find us. Uh, and it's a very, very big deterrent uh, for other countries to kind of not mess with us. Um, my job in the Navy, I did have a little bit to do with launching missiles, but uh, mostly my job was to work in the back half of the submarine in the engine room. Uh, the engine room uh, contains a reactor compartment, which you cannot enter while the submarine is uh, operating and at sea. Uh, but basically they use a very hot rock made of uranium to boil water, which then spins turbines uh, that propel the submarine through the ocean, create electricity for the submarine, as well as power all of this other equipment. So as a machinist mate, there was all kinds of equipment in this engine room. Uh, when I joined the Navy, I'm telling you, I didn't know a flathead screwdriver from a Phillips head screwdriver. Uh, and by the end of my 11 years in the Navy, um, you guys can see this big list of uh, equipment here. Uh, I've got quite the, the technical skill set. And I tell you what, I fixed the bejeez out of my dryer the other day. I've never taken a dryer before. <laughs> it worked out really well for me uh, here in the years. But um, if you take a look at this stuff over here on the right. So, you know, while I did have all these technical skills uh, related to taking equipment apart and putting it back together, uh, the military also teaches you a lot of things that every single employer on the planet is looking for. Um, employers like loyalty, punctuality, they want people that can work at a team, people that can work under pressure. And I tell you, uh, there's uh, very few places with more pressure than a thousand feet under a very unforgiving ocean. Um, they want people who can delegate authority, follow instructions, meet deadlines. And these are all things uh, that are non-negotiable in the military. You are where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there. You work with your teammates and you get things done. So, um, you know, even if you join the military for only a short time, having that bullet on your resume is something it doesn't matter Absolutely. what you're in. You could go be a nurse. You could be an engineer. You could be a school teacher. Everybody looks at somebody who's been in the military. and It is a very, very positive thing. And it's worked out really well for me. Um, again, 
Zero dollars is what I paid for my education just because I joined the military. Um, I did. So, so I told you all the degrees I got. It was a lot of school. It was a lot of school. Uh, and I had to balance that with working at night, working uh, shift work. I got married. I had a couple of kids. Um, and so it's it, it was a long, a long road. But now it's all behind me. Uh, and I've kind of moved forward with my stuff. Um, so like I said, uh, I work for Thurn, Winches, and Crane. So we are a factory. We're headquartered here in Winona, Minnesota. Uh, we do a lot of cool things. I'll get into some of the projects that we were able to work uh, on. We, we, we took a look at some of your products uh, Wednesday, and nice. y'all are making some pretty, pretty cool stuff. Yeah, yeah, we are. I'll, I'll show you some stuff that may or may not be on our website, too. But um, we kind of have two overall uh, brands of equipment. We have Thurn, Winches, and Cranes, which uh, these big Red units up here is a big industrial winch or a, a davit crane, which is roughly the size of a person, maybe five, six feet tall. You might see this mounted on top of a building. And then we also have Thurn stage equipment. So if at Velma Jackson, you guys have a performing arts center uh, with backdrops that are going up and down or lights that are going up and down, we make hoisting yep. for those types of things. And so I kind of sit down here as the product manager and I'm trying to decide, well, what product should we develop? Uh, what products should we change? What products should we not offer anymore? Uh, and I kind of take all that feedback from the sales team. So we have salesmen all across the country, all across the world who are talking to customers every single day. And those salespeople will come to me and be like, hey, man, you know, they really wanted a, a, a hoist that could do this or a winch that can do that. We don't make that. Why don't we make that? Um, and I kind of take all of those ideas from, from the sales team. And I work with all of these departments over here on the right. I work with our engineering team to design products, our purchasing team to purchase the materials we need. Production, which includes a whole lot of departments uh, and a whole lot of great trades, including electrical, welding, cutting, machining, bending. Uh, our planning department has to plan all this work out because we have a big, busy factory. Um, I work with the quality department, shipping and receiving. So I literally touch uh, every piece of the company. And you know, our goal is to bring new products to market because we're kind of in this stage where... We want to grow our company. Uh, we're about a $30 million company right now. And in 10 years, we want to be a $100 million company. And we're not going to do wow. it by selling the same products we have today to the same people that we're selling them to. We need new products to sell into new markets. Um, some of the cool projects that, that we've worked on, uh, we have worked with NASA. This uh, platform you see on the left has two big red thern winches on it. And those winches pull this movable platform uh, kind of towards the space shuttle so that people can Dang. walk. We've also worked wow. with another space company. I can't tell you the name of the space company, but it's owned by Elon Musk, who also owns Twitter and whatever else, but we can't talk about it. But we worked with them on some uh, some really cool projects. Um, this is one of our favorite projects. It really is our claim to fame. The year literally does not go on to a new year without Thurn Incorporated, but the Times Square Ball. Uh, that moves up and down. Uh, underneath it is uh, this special industrial winch here. Um, we actually sent our applications engineer, Jeff Wilkowski, who's the guy you see here in this picture. He was just at the Times Square Ball about two weeks ago. Uh, so every year we send an engineer out to just take a look at that winch. Is it running like it is supposed to run? Does it have all the oil it needs to have in it? Is it going to drop the Times Square Ball in the middle of New Year's Eve, which would be a disaster uh, for us? Um, so this is, uh, you know, a really cool project making the Times Square ball go up and down. Uh, I don't know how many of you are NFL football fans, but if you watched the NFL draft, uh, not the most recent one, but the one last year that took place in Kansas City, uh, we designed all of the winches and controls that raised the stage. So on the left is kind of what the NFL draft stage looked like um, before the ceiling was raised. The ceiling is made up of the grid work you see at the bottom. And our winches took that grid work, raised it up to the top of these pillars uh, so that you could then stretch, you know, this bud like fabric or whatever. And then this was the NFL stage uh, as it existed. So we work on uh, a lot of uh, a lot of really cool projects. Um, you know, as a sales and marketing guy, it took me a, a long time to get here, going from being a mechanic in the Navy uh, to kind of working my way over into, into sales and marketing. But uh you know, the job itself is very interesting. I get to touch uh, every single department. I get to work on very big company initiatives. Uh, I report directly to the vice president of sales and marketing, which is something I never thought little old me from uh, Jackson, Mississippi would ever say. But, um, you know, it's working out pretty well. Um, and again, when I got out of high school, I had no idea I was going to be doing any of this stuff, man. I was just lost trying to find my way. And, uh, 
my way happened to be uh, through the military and then uh, using those benefits to get some free college. So um, if any of you guys are, are looking to join the military, look into it. You can pick what it, from a, a variety of jobs. You don't, I just showed up and said, I need money, man. I don't, I don't know. Just I'll do whatever. Uh, but you can actually do something you're interested in. If you're interested in computers, there's IT jobs. If you're interested in video games, you can fly drones around the world. I mean, there's really no shortage of things you can do uh, uh, when you serve your country. So um, that's kind of who I am and, and, and how I got here. Um, you know, and I hope you guys, uh, I wish you guys the best. You guys, uh, is your class all seniors, Greg? They're seniors or juniors? Uh, no, I've got, I've got a mix of sophomores and seniors. Sophomores and seniors. So you guys got a little bit more time, but, uh, you know, best of luck to all of you and, and whatever it is you choose to do out there. It's a, it's a big world with a lot of opportunity and, uh, there is not just one path to get to where you want to go. You can, uh, go wherever you want, however you want. It's just, uh, do you want to do the work it takes to get there? Yeah, and uh, and you mentioned a, a few things about some of the trade jobs, you know, yeah. with um, with uh, and you, I'm glad you mentioned machinists because that's a really hot trade right now. Oh. We have we have machinist programs at Heinz and Homes here of, available. That's yeah, a, and that's a, great. And a, I tell a ten, you right now, we program. Have, uh, our our machinist lead, So we've got I don't know, fifteen turning centers in our factory, mills, lathes, uh, all kinds of stuff. And we actually run an internship program. So there's a technical college that's very close uh, to our factory, uh, Winona Technical College. And uh, we take machinists that are in that program. And then like after class, they just come in and apprentice like under uh, our experienced machinists. And so they they get to learn in school. We pay them, you know, intern money, 15, 20 bucks an hour. I don't really know what it is uh, to come in after work. So they get to earn a little bit of money. They get some real world experience. And then we hope they come work for us because we are always short machinist. And, you know, I, I would tell you guys, if you're looking into going into trades, good for you, because you are going to have no shortages of opportunities after school. Uh, my neighbor across the street, actually, his son graduated uh, two years ago, and he kind of is in the same plan. He's going to technical college for welding, and he has a part-time job in a small fab shop here in town. Uh, so he's gaining experience, paying for his school, all at the same time. Um, and again, welders, machinists, electricians that work at factories and stuff, they are in such high demand. If you went to our website right now, you'd see four, five, six job openings. And we're a small company, all all in, in the trades type of work. Yeah. And I'm trying to I'm trying to maximize your uh, screen here. I'm sorry. Yeah. And I. Uh, 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 let's see. Let's stop share. There we go. All right. Yep. Oh, awesome. All right. Now, now, and a couple other things I, I wanted to mention, because obviously I, I don't want to tell our age too much, but when you went through the military, a lot of these engineering and technological advances were not available yet. So now, yeah. in, you know, especially Navy and Air Force and, and, and you know, Army and Marines as well, but in, in, in the Space Force, but if somebody wants to get state of the art technological training and then move into the workforce, you know, you're going to be dealing with uh, engineering things that are going to translate into any industry. You're going to get paid to do it. And, uh, and I know when you were on the submarine, you went all over the world. You'd be able to yeah. see places you never would have been able to see otherwise. And then with all these technological advances with cybersecurity and IT and uh, information systems that and intelligence that these uh branches use that's going to translate into six-figure tech jobs after just a few years of serving in the military and i think and you, i know you mentioned the movies i think a big uh, hindrance for a lot of kids is they think military all they think about are things they saw in the movies all they think about is you know kick down doors blow stuff up top gun screaming fighter jets and that's just such a small part of what the military actually does there are so many great ways that you can serve your country and you other than going to basic training you're never touching a weapon yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I uh, the the only time I ever carried a, a weapon, I had to do training twice a year. And when we were in port, I carried a sidearm that I never used one time. We were buried so far deep in a Navy base. And then once you take your ship on deployment, nobody carries a weapon. You, you lock them all up in lockers and you're just out, uh, you know, out in the ocean doing your thing. But you're absolutely right, man. I mean, just on a submarine alone, we had IT people. We had cooks. We had a doctor. 
Uh, we've got engineering people, we have officers, we have administration people. Like it doesn't matter what you want to do, the Navy, the Air Force, all of these military organizations, they're just massive organizations. And they have opportunities for you no matter what it is that you want to do. Um, and you're right, uh, the technologies these days, a lot of groundbreaking technologies originate in the military because Absolutely. the military has a really big budget and they go to really big companies like Raytheon or Lockheed Martin and they're like, hey, we need a missile that can do all this crazy stuff. And then, you know, all of a sudden that exists. That's how we got GPS. Like GPS was a big military technology and now it's on everybody's cell phone on the planet, you know? Um, so you're exactly right. It doesn't matter what you want to do. High tech jobs, uh, definitely translating into opportunities, not only because of your technical skill set, but of all the soft skills you get. Man, when somebody hires a veteran, they know what they're getting. Absolutely. And and that's the thing. You get a uh, interview preference with veteran status. So if you have even just four or five years of military experience, that's going to put you to the top of the list. That's so, yeah, I think that's something that uh, our kids really need to understand. If you're, you know, if someone is in a similar situation that you were in in high school, you, you know, you're kind of unsure about what you want to do. Maybe your parent, I, I hear all the time, I want to go to college. My family can't really afford it. Um, even though there's great ACT scholarships out there now, you know, we've had kids say, look, I can go to college, but I want to get the heck out of Dodge. And we have a, a we have an alum that graduated in 2017 He's a part of the Air Force Special Forces, uh, and he's been all over. He's been to Southeast Asia. He's been to Europe. He's uh, he's at Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma now. But he said, man, I wouldn't have traded this for the world. Um, and he's learned all kind of great skills and just fallen into – he's fallen into an associate he didn't even know he was getting. Yep, yep, yeah. that happens too. Um, when I first got my associates, they uh, they actually asked to see, hey, can we see your military transcripts and can see this, that, and the other? And they went through all these things and said – you don't need to take math 101 guy who, uh, you know, took three months of advanced calculus for a Navy nuclear power course. And I got college credit for all of that stuff, too. Um, so there's a lot of universities, a lot of these, I think they call them gold ribbon universities or something like that, that have very close partnerships with the military to specifically help veterans get their degrees. Because these colleges are very, 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 very well aware of the benefits that veterans receive for serving their country in terms of hey, you can use this money to go to college. So there's a lot of colleges out there that seek veterans to, to come work at their programs. Um, and so again, it was just a really a really great opportunity for me. Um, I know I've said it 80 times, I was a knucklehead growing up and, and thank goodness that uh, I found an opportunity if somebody put down some rails and said, just stay in, hey man, just stay in between these things and uh, you know, you're gonna be okay. And I, and I certainly was. Yeah, and then I, I thought it was cool you showed some of those pulleys because we haven't gotten to it yet, but that's part of the six simple machines in yeah. engineering. It, it's, uh, the pulley and winch is, is a part of that because it makes jobs easier. So yeah. what are some of the things, uh, some of the other things that kids may not think about that pulleys and winches are used on every single day and have to be manufactured? Yeah, so I mean, we, I, we have no shortage uh, of different applications that our customers call in for. Uh, wastewater treatment plants uh, is a huge segment for us. So I imagine that uh, nobody's been to a wastewater treatment plant because nobody has. I've been to a couple just to do product research or whatever, but there's a bunch of open pits of water and you know they're, they're cleaning the water that comes out of your house, but they have mixers that have to be raised up and down and water gates that have to move up and down. All of this stuff uh, takes winches. Um, the other day I visited, oh, not the other day. So about a month ago, I went down to Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, Louisville, Kentucky is right on the Ohio river and they have two of our large winches that move barges back and forth so that a big, you know, bucket truck can scoop the gravel out. They dump it in a funnel and then it went up the hill to this, uh, concrete factory on, on conveyor belts. Um, we have a lot of high tech opportunities uh, in our theater department. We don't uh, make winches and cranes that fly people around in theaters. There's a whole lot of insurance liability things you have to think about if you're gonna lift a human being like 40 feet off the ground. Uh, so it's not something we play in, but we do do a lot of, uh, you know, if you've ever been to a theater and found yourself thinking, wow, how did they do this? How did they move up and down? How did they get it to fly across the room so fast? Um, you know, we do those things. We also get requests um, for cranes and winches that are made out of alternate equipment. Obviously, steel is a readily available material that's mined out of the earth. It goes through foundries or all over the place. We can get it all the time. But some of our customers are like, hey, well, steel's really heavy. Can you make it out of aluminum? Can you make it out of a composite material? And so then we got to go and do 
research on those things. Um, and so really, you know, if you need something to move up, down, something to be repositioned or rehold, if it's big, if it's small, um, you know, no matter what it is, we can uh, probably help you with that. You see our, our technologies and uh, buildings under construction. Uh, the big Ferris wheel in Las Vegas was a project that we worked on. And the sphere oh, in wow. Las Vegas is that building was being constructed. We had several winches in there. Um, you know, so there's really no shortage of opportunities. And, and I would say, you know, more than our standard products that we sell, at least 60% of our products are custom made to the person that ordered them. So, Hey, I have an oil rig. I wow. need a winch. It's this big. It's got to do this thing. By the way, I need some special certification because it's on an oil rig in the middle of the ocean and we got to meet all these standards. Um, and so, you know, really it's, uh, no shortage of uh, opportunities. We also get uh, smaller, you know, less sophisticated opportunities. Uh, Siemens flagpoles. Uh, they have they make very large flagpoles for like those flags you see in front of like Camping World, like the really big flagpoles. And they have a third winch that's yeah. built into their product to raise and lower the flag. Um, wow. And so, you know, really no shortage. And uh, when it comes to customizations and how winches work and um, what you have to do to make sure you're not going to break something or hurt somebody when you're, when you're lifting a load, you know, there's no shortage of opportunities and it doesn't really matter what, you know, what your role is here at the company. You know, it's all about safety, quality, and building a, building a good product for our customers. All right. Now, before I get to their questions, there's one more thing I want to talk about. And you had this on your slide and I think this is important. And yeah. I know I can speak for all the other teachers that'll see this later is that, the amount of soft skills, even in, in the military, even, you know, because I hear kids all the time say, well, uh, I'm, I'm going to go to trade school, you know, I, I shouldn't have to do presentations. They're about, they don't know it yet. They're about to get a, a assignment where they're going to have to work together here in a second. But how important is that ability to communicate, to work together, to be able to present, articulate, sell, even if you are a, a trade person, even if you are a truck driver, even if you are a, uh, yeah. Uh, somebody that's working in the factory. So how important are the skills, not just in the military, but in business? They're, they're so important. So at, at some point, you know, in the military, I did some training of personnel. I worked at a training command. Then when I got out of the Navy, I was an instructor at a utility company. And then I became a training manager uh, and a manufacturer. So I have been working in and around expressing your ideas and communicating with people and trying to further your department's agenda for a really long time. And, you know, I didn't want to be a training and development professional for a long time, but I tell people all the time that, you know, my four, five, six years of working and training and development and putting PowerPoints together and explaining things to people who don't understand them and getting my ideas across and helping people understand things, how I understand them, incredibly important, you know, as a training professional, your job just kind of lends itself to that, right? So I'm training somebody who doesn't know anything about this and I'm increasing their knowledge about this. Well, you know, in the business world, I don't uh, I do not do that so much anymore. I'm not always training people. I do sometimes train folks, our sales team. I train them on new products and stuff. But a lot of times I'm just trying to help my leadership team understand, look, if we develop a new hand winch, we might make some new money, but we need a strategy. And this is why, and this is the products we need to develop. And really just my ability to articulate those ideas and help people understand, you know, the way that I'm thinking is, uh, well, I think it's 90% of the reason that I have the job. I don't, uh, I don't build anything. I don't make anything. None of these products exist because I put my hands on it. I don't design it. I'm literally just having meetings with people all the time, uh, sharing my ideas and saying, Hey, this is where I think we need to go. Um, so, you know, any opportunity you have, uh, you know, whether it be in school or after school or whatever, to stand in front of a room full of people and explain yourself or present an idea, take those opportunities. You know, I, I read this thing the other day that, uh, you know, the number one fear in the world is public speaking and the number two fear in the world is death. So people would literally rather be in the coffin than give the eulogy, which is just insane to me. But you see it over and over. So there's a lot of people that, um, you know, have a real hard time either speaking in front of crowds or even smaller presentations. But, um, you know, those soft skills, your ability to communicate, organize your thoughts and present them to other people. I mean, not everybody can do it. I'm sure everybody has sat in a room at some point when somebody was trying to explain yeah. something to them and you're like, what are you talking about? No yeah, because it's not always it's not always the smartest person, but the best salesman is the one that's going to make the money. Yeah, that that's right. That's right. 
but I do got some questions, and I like these. These are all really good. Uh, this person is Bryson Stevens. He's in ninth grade. And he asked, what's the hardest thing you ever had to do while you were in the military? Oh, the hardest thing that I ever had to do in the military. Um, so being on board, uh, I mean, deployment in and of itself is hard. Um, so I, my the first deployment, uh, you know, I ever did. This is the first time I'm literally out of the country. The first time I'm away from anybody and everybody. Uh, I did not see the sun for 92 days or whatever. So, you know, keeping all of your mental health just together uh, while you're in the Navy and deploying and uh, doing things, you know, sometimes you do things that uh, you're like, this makes no sense. Why would I clean this spot on the floor? I've already cleaned it 12 times. You know, like, well, because it has to be clean and you just do it. So, you know, kind of a, kind of a roundabout answer, but I think really just, uh, you know, going on deployment, uh, being away from, I mean, I didn't see the news for long periods of time, didn't see the sun, couldn't talk to my wife. Uh, every now and then, you know, a boat might pull up next to us and bring us mail, uh, you know, from our families back home. We call it a mail drop or they might bring us fresh eggs or something. Um, so, you know, deployment in general, uh, pretty mentally tough, Um but overall, you know, still a good experience. That's a good question. I don't know if I've ever really thought about it. But but I do know, I have heard from several people, including our classmate Judah Clark, that when you're on the boat, you eat good and there's always something to do. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, and it's funny, I think the submarine force is well known in the Navy for having one of the best uh, meal times. But yeah, it, was, uh, it wasn't too bad. Four meals served every day, one every six hours. Um, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and then a midnight meal. Uh, on Saturdays, we had burgers for lunch. On Fridays was pizza night. And then like every third Sunday, we would get, uh, well, steak and crab legs. You know, I mean, it wasn't like Ruth's Chris or anything. But uh, if when you've been on deployment for three months, you'll take whatever crab legs they'll give you. Hey, you know, hey, 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 and it's free. Yeah, totally free. And that <laughs> was the other pretty thing about going on deployment. Uh, I didn't have time to spend any money. Uh, and so by the time you get home from being on deployment, I mean, they're feeding you, they're housing you or whatever. You're just, your, your bank account just builds itself up and they stick you in a tin can for three months. Absolutely. Uh, this is Rashawn Smith. He's a senior. And he asked, would you recommend someone going to the Navy uh, after their senior year in high school? Yeah. You know, I absolutely, I would recommend it. Um, you know, the the Navy, the Air Force, you know, whatever it is you join, I don't know a whole lot about the Space Force yet. Um, but yeah, they will explain to you everything that needs explaining. You will gain life experiences that you will gain nowhere else. You get to be a part of a team that literally does one of the most important things, uh, in our country, which would be freedom fighter of, uh, you know, freedom and democracy. You get all of these things and they pay you to do it. Um, and you know, when you walk away, uh, you walk away with a lot of good memories. Uh, you walk away with a lot of good skills, and uh, there'll be a lot of opportunities in front of you. Absolutely. All right, I've got two more. This is Darius Cooper. He's a senior, one of our football players here. Nice. And one of our power lifters. Uh, and he asked, uh, at Thurn, what are you guys' plans for growth, and what segments do you see yourself going after in business? Yeah, great question. So, you know, our plans for growth – uh, kind of center around a couple of things. Uh, one of them being growing in our existing markets and our existing existing opportunities. So we kind of have three large vertical markets we go after. Uh, one of them is our theater market and our bread and butter for theater is not like Cirque du Soleil or professional theaters or that. We are middle schools and high schools. Like 80% yeah. of our projects are middle schools and high schools. So uh, we have plans to not only build out our sales teams, but we have to build out connections in the industry. We're going to be visiting with consultants, because um, consultants write specifications for theaters. And if the consultant knows who you are, they can write your product into those specifications. Um, in our wastewater market, we're developing lightweight cranes. Um, so, and then uh, in our industrial market, we do take a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of custom uh, projects in that market, but we are looking at uh, going after other markets that we don't serve today. One place that you see um, a lot of winches would be on the front bumper of like a Jeep uh, or sometimes a fire truck. My, and so we don't make winches of that nature. Um, and so the winches we make tend to be a little bigger, a little more industrial. Uh, and you can go to Northern Tool or whatever and get a, a smaller winch that might go on a bumper or an ATV. Uh, but and, and you know, for $400. Uh, but that is a market we don't play in. And it's absolutely flipping massive. 
Um, and so we're kind of going after that segment a little bit. And so outside of business segments, we also have geographic segments. And right now, about 90-ish percent of our sales come from North America either or, or Central America. So U.S., Canada, uh, or Central America. And the other 10% comes from uh, Europe. And so we are looking to expand wow. geographically into other parts of the world, which is really hard. Uh, language barriers are something that are, are really tough. Like it is tough for us to sell somebody who lives in the Netherlands. A thing when, when I mean, we're in the US, we speak English and all of our you know marketing materials in English. So you got to find salespeople that can speak multiple languages. I tell you guys right now, I don't know if you guys are taking uh, foreign language classes. Take all of them, all of them. I we would hire somebody that spoke multiple languages for a, a position where a degree was required, even if they didn't have a degree. Like speaking multiple languages and being able to talk to people is probably one of the most valuable things you can do in business. I can't tell. I mean, the, the amount of job opportunities I see these days that are, hey, we're looking for somebody bilingual who can speak Spanish because we're trying to grow our business in, you know, Latin America or whatever the case may be. So. We're trying to grow geographically. Uh, we're signing up new distributors. We do have our own internal salespeople, but they basically sell to people who sell our stuff. Um, so we're trying to drum up more distributors, uh, especially in China, Australia. New Zealand has a lot of interest wow. in our products right now, but New Zealand has some interesting laws in there. So sometimes when uh, we have several products that we can sell here in the U.S., that we can't sell other places because they don't have the right type of electric motor on it or, or whatever the case may be. So, you know, that's part of the other job that I do is try to say, well, we sell this product here, but we don't sell any in Canada. Why not figure that out? Sell more in Canada or sell more in the Netherlands, whatever the case may be. So we're growing geographically, we're developing new products and we're trying to grow organically through our existing sales force by calling on more customers. That's awesome. I just got one more. <clears throat> this is Jada Green. She's a senior. And she asked, what was the biggest inspiration to pursue this career? Well, uh, I will be honest with you guys. I would like to make a whole boatload of money one day, like a whole boatload of money. Um, and, you know, sales and marketing is kind of where the money is. Uh, and so that so, you know, that's that's kind of my ultimate goal. I mean, you know, my I don't intend to stop. Uh, at middle management, I would like to be, you know, upper, bigger, bigger, you know, whatever management. Um, but a little bit beyond that. So I'm not I'm not trying to say I'm just a money grubber, but I mean, we're all going to work for the money. I'm not going to lie. Oh, and health insurance. I got four kids. I need health insurance. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I always like sales and marketing because uh, it's kind of a puzzle that you're trying to solve all of the time. Like we're a 30 million dollar company in a $50 billion market. How do I make our company bigger? And I'm just solving puzzles all day long. How do we develop one of these? How do we get it to market? Uh, and sometimes we get big winners uh, and we develop a product that sells, you know, 3 million bucks worth of product a year. I have, have other products that we've worked on where we completely missed the market. We have not sold one unit. Um, so kind of hit or miss, very exciting when it's a hit, uh, not so exciting when it's a miss. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of where I'm at. I just I don't want to get up every day and be bored. I want to contribute to something. So I don't want to just enter Zeta all day or something. I don't know. Uh, and I want to do something I enjoy. So that that's what I do. And, and but well, getting in getting into any type of engineering field, whether you go military or not, it's never going to be boring with all these technological advances. Yeah, no, never going to be boring. And uh, you know, I think every engineering department spends a lot of time trying to upgrade their current technologies too. Um, and so, you know, our engineering department, beyond just designing our products, they try to modernize our factory, change the way how we put stuff together. Well, let's change the way how we build this so it's put together easier and, and you know, all kinds of stuff. So, um, you know, you're exactly right. No shortage of opportunities, um, especially especially in the, in the engineering field. We're hoping to soon make products that, uh, I mean, a hand winch is a pretty simple product, but a larger industrial winch. We could probably make it so we could log on to that thing and adjust it remotely and, wow. and have it talk to us or spit out a dashboard. Like there's all kinds of uh, of technology that that we can pursue there. Wow. Well, we're almost out of time. And, and we thank you so much again for joining us. Um, and it's just it's crazy to think we've known each other almost 30 years. But, yeah. um, you know, well, before we go, I think it's important. You know, you, you know, you mentioned a little bit about your background, you know, ha having the single parent home not having a whole lot of money growing up. You yourself were at alternative school. 
um, mm -hmm. twice, you said, uh, and we're going to show, and we're going to make this, uh, my friend, uh, Mr. Freeman over at the alternative school is going to have this as, as well for his class. So right. I think it's important. You know, you're sitting in the same place that a lot of these kids were, but you don't let, you, you never let your current situation determine your outcome. So yeah. there's a lot of great careers that, if, you know, if a kid thinks, look, I'm not smart enough to go to college. Well, that's fine. If you don't think you're smart enough to go to college, you can learn these skills now and become extremely successful. So well, what are some things that they can start working on now when they're 16, 17 years old to prepare them for a great career like you have? You know, I tell you what, I one of the uh, one of the things I see a lot, Greg, uh, especially uh, when I'm hiring folks, um, interviewing and interviewing etiquette and understanding how to put together your resume. And, and these things are so easily learnable, but uh, I participated and this was for, for college students actually, but there's no reason a high school student couldn't do this as well. But I participated in an interview board. So it was, uh, it was me. I worked for a company called Tenant at the time. And then we had executives there from Target and Best Buy, which are both headquartered uh, here in the Twin Cities. And, and uh, college students just had an assignment, which was put together your resume and go in and do an interview with these people. Uh, and we gave them a ton of feedback, but just, you know, your ability to uh, put a resume together and your ability to interview and present yourself well uh, to a potential employers is very important. Um, and, you know, also, you know, always just keep in mind that it's not just, you know, the things that you've done or the skills that you have uh, that employers look for, but they look for all kinds of things. I mean, you can put anything on your resume to show that you're just a diverse, interesting, well-rounded person. Um, and so, you know, I've interviewed for, I was laid off during COVID before I, you know, I ended up uh, here at Thurn, but uh, I got all kinds of questions from employers because employers today, you know, they don't only want to know, can you do this job? They want to know if you're a fit for their company and their culture. Uh, and so, you know, as you start looking into fields or activities or jobs that you might be interested in, um, you know, understanding what the culture is around those jobs and, and what the work is going to be like and understanding what you're going to do, um, you know, is a lot better. I, I've interviewed folks over the years, you know, they come in and, you know, they're like, hey, I don't know what this job is and or how I would do it. I, I think you're going to tell me that, you know, you're the boss. And I've had I've interviewed other folks who walked in and said, you know, this is how I'm going to do the job. I'm going to do X. I'm going to do Y. I, I used to do this at another company. And, you know, they just present themselves well. Uh, and so there's no reason you can't start thinking about those, you know, opportunities now or sharpening your skills uh, when it comes to to interviewing or, or putting a resume together. Even if you're a high school student, you know, without a ton of real world work experience, there's plenty you can put on a resume that just talks about who you are and what you're capable of. It's not always necessarily about what you've done, because, you, you know, when you're young, you haven't done a lot. Uh, but what are you capable of? Yeah, we could go down a whole other rabbit hole on that, but um, I know you got to get back to work. But you know, you know, it's crazy. You know, it, these kids don't believe me all the time. It seems like yesterday we were dicking around in the uh, in the Rosa Scott gym. So um, yeah. it's uh, it, it really it really does fly by. It but does. it's just there's never been a better time to be uh, to be mindful and professional and start learning these skills now. But we, again, we just thank you so much for joining us again. And it's always a pleasure. Chris Riley, all the way from Winona, Minnesota, there in Thurn, Navy Vet, Madison yep. Central. Thank you so much, buddy. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks again. And sorry I missed you on Wednesday. You guys have a good day. No problem. See you soon, buddy. Go yeah. Pack. Go Pack. <laughs>